Well, Scott was wondering if I still know how to do this this morning. So uh, he's not in the room, so you'll have to tell him, okay, afterward whether that answer is a yes or no. But uh, June's, June uh, is regretful that she can't be here this morning. Uh, she's caring for her parents again, as she often does on, on the weekends. But uh, June and I are just back from Hong Kong, where we were for about 10 days. Hong Kong is where we served in, as missionaries for 15 years. Uh, about 15 years ago is when we served there. We, we've uh, visited numerous times, but not for the, about the last four and a half years or so. And so uh, uh, a couple of uh, pictures here. This is uh, Pastor Jeremiah Choi and his wife Wendy. Pastor Jeremiah was, uh, was the pastor that I worked the closest with during our years in Hong Kong. And uh, he's, he's older than me, though, because we went for his retirement celebration, okay? And, uh, and so uh, that, that, that um, is a very precious relationship there. Here's just a picture of part of, of the church group. There's three, uh, three uh, Mennonite churches there, three churches that are sister churches to, to us. This is not everybody, there, but uh, just some of the uh, leaders and people that were there at the retirement celebration time. Let's go on. Um, Hong Kong is just a busy place, full of people uh, crowded in together. And so this is just a city street just showing the vibrant hub of activity. I think the only place in the U.S. that I've ever been that gives me a little bit of the feeling of, of Hong Kong is, is uh, New York City, where the buildings are, t are tall and close together, and uh, some places the sun doesn't shine all that much because of, of, uh, of uh, how tall the buildings are. Okay, last one then. Um, there's June looking out over the city. When you, this is a scenic view. Uh, over the uh, central business district and, and, uh, and uh, onto the other side of the harbor where uh, much more of a commercial and then uh, residential areas there. Uh, just looking out over this uh, city of 8 million or so people that have gone through a lot of hardships in the last while because of changes in their situation and um, uh, greater um, restrictions from the government that's been happening but uh, the church is still there the church is still um, uh, worshiping Jesus and so we join them this morning in worshiping that same God so this morning as indicated by Greg uh, reading the scripture and lighting the candle here we start in Advent Advent is this uh, 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 building into us the awareness and the expectation that we are about to commemorate the fact that there was a day on the calendar that God himself came into this world in physical form. He was a baby in a manger in Bethlehem in Israel and gave his name Jesus, right? And so we want to be uh, making ourselves very conscious of that. It not only happened physically, but it happens in our lives as well, right? It's symbolic of us saying, let's prepare again to increase the way that we allow God's presence to be part of our lives, not just some sort of spiritual thing that happens way up there, but that enters into, into our daily existence. Often in, in, a, at a, in an Advent time, in Christmas season, we use the word Emmanuel, right? Do you, do you know what Emmanuel means? God with us. And so it, it, uh, it kind of becomes one of those cliche expressions that it's like we know that, but it's like, can we really just stop and think about that? Let, 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 let's uh, go to the, uh, to the diagram there of the, of the oxygen and nitrogen. And so, uh, you know, our air is composed mostly of nitrogen and oxygen. Now, all of you know that oxygen is part of air, right? I bet not all of us could have been able to say what that other ingredient is of nitrogen, right? It's just kind of there, but we really don't think about it. It's the oxygen that our cells need to, to uh, thrive, right? We breathe in the air, it extracts the, nit the uh, oxygen, it, uh, it uh, sends out carbon dioxide, it's the oxygen that connects with the blood that flows through the uh, to the cells of our body 
and gives us life. Did I do okay on the biology lesson there? All, all you biology students? Okay, very good. Okay, now, now what happens to the nitrogen? It's just kind of there, right? It's an inert ingredient. So I feel that sometimes when we just sort of say God with us, we kind of treat it like it's nitrogen. It's, it's like it's just kind of, yeah, well, yeah, that's true, but does it impact my life? How do we bring it to the place where it's the oxygen, where it's this God with us? So let's sort of just change the phrase and say God shows up. God is with us because he's showing up and he's involved in situations, in my circumstances, in my life. And what, what I became very aware of in these last number of weeks as I've been meditating into this season is that God didn't just sort of suddenly stand back and do nothing and then pop, here's Jesus. But God is showing up all through the Bible, all through the Old Testament. And so as we go through this Advent season, that's, that's what we want to be looking at. <coughs> Some of the ways that we can be uh, seeing God showing up, being with his people, being physically present on earth before the arrival of Jesus. In fact, we, are, uh, we have prepared a, uh, a, a devotional for you to go through every day starting tomorrow where, where uh, every day will be a day of God showing up among his people in the Old Testament. Some of them will be very familiar to you. Some of them will not be very familiar to you. Uh, and you'll be able to be meditating on, on, uh, on uh, that. <coughs> Excuse me here. I think uh, someone's already going for a little bit of water to help me out here. Maybe I don't know how to do this anymore. Huh? It seems like, <laughs> seems like I'm struggling a bit. Okay. So the question then for us is, if you go to the next slide, how is God showing up in your life? The question, or, or, or the, uh, thank you, the, uh, the thing is that God shows up. And so it's one thing to say he's showing up out there, but the more important question for you is, right, how is he showing up with you? How is he showing up in your life, and then how is he showing up through you to other people? Because when we give our lives to Christ, Jesus, we are about becoming like Christ, right? So just as Jesus shows up, the question then is, how is he stirring in your heart to be showing up in the various situations, to be showing up with the presence of Jesus exuding in your life wherever he calls you to be and to uh, in your daily activity? And um, so... We'll be having those themes nurtured in our daily devotional in the booklets that will be handed out at the end of the service. Is that right? Okay. Okay, they're at the Information Center. So, uh, so uh, help yourself there as we uh, end the service this morning. So let's uh, read about this, about when God shows up in the beginning of the book. God plants a garden. He creates Adam and Eve. In his image, he uh, gives them the garden as their home, and then he comes and visits them in the garden. Chapter 2, verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God placed the man in the garden to tend and watch over it, but the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees, and then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Um, Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. 
The Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the, serp the serpent, Because you've done this, you're cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You'll crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. There's three scenes in this passage. Let's look at scene one. It's the ideal garden. It's the place where God created the world in the way that He intended it to be. There's the creation, the plants, the animals, all living in harmony with each other. Into the middle of it, He places Adam and Eve, these people that were made in His image, to carry pieces of His nature and to live it out and as, as part of the created being, but established with a spirit that's able to make self-conscious choice in order to worship God, to choose to be in relationship with God and to commune with Him. And so God would come into the garden and would say, so, so God had said to, the, to uh, Adam and Eve, you take care of the garden. God's the creator. He makes us creative, right? And so He says, take this and improve upon it. Add into it. Glorify me by what you do with the abilities that I've placed within you. And so then I'm imagining that God would come in and say, what have you done today? How have you worked in my garden? How have you done this work that brings glory to me? One day, God comes into the garden and they don't show up. It's like, uh-oh, something's changed. There's always this tendency, right? When you do something <laughs> that you say, maybe I shouldn't have done that that then you draw back, right? How many times have you heard in, even like in public, in the political arena, where, where it's like when a politician gets into trouble, it's not so much for what's done, but it's because they tried to cover it up, right? It's because they pulled back. It's because they started to lie about it. It's because they started to deceive and to try to say it's not that way. So what had happened in between time was that the serpent had entered into the garden, right? We'll get to that in stage two. But right now, God is interacting and trying to be in relationship with his people and finding out that the people are drawing back, they're isolating themselves, and they're not ready to keep on investing into this relationship with their creator. Does that seem sensible to you? It seems like rather... A strange thing, right? Here they are in this ideal garden. They're ministering in this, in this I mean, they're, they're there. They're able to talk with God himself, to meet him face to face, and then suddenly they step back from that as though they could improve upon that setting. Scene two. Lucifer enters the picture. Lucifer is described as this as a serpent. Now, just imagine something much more than a snake, right? Because the punishment was to grovel on his body, so that means probably that when, when, uh, when uh, the, serpent w the, the, the serpent would have walked into the garden, right? So what do you think the serpent was? I don't know. I mean, we could have fun just, just, uh, just uh, thinking, thinking of our imaginations there. But but, 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 but it's this attractive, magnificent being and comes into the garden and says to Adam and Eve, um, what did God say about this tree? This tree of knowledge of good and evil? Don't you want to know what that's like? And it's not just this test of like, are you going to eat a candy bar? But to take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is to say, don't you want to be the one that determines what's good and what's evil? How come you're depending upon somebody else for that? God made you to be a person that makes choice. Make your choices. Decide what's good and what's evil. And a lot of people do that, right? Some of us have tried that ourselves, right? And God a lot of times allows us to do that, right? Right? But the unspoken underneath that is that when those choices are made, there's consequences to those choices, right? Because that's the way the world's set up. That's the way it's designed to be. 
because you're not the creator and I'm not the creator, we don't get to recreate the world. We get to live in the world. We get to live in it in the design of the creator. But you have a choice whether you want to live in cooperation with that design or whether you want to stand outside of that and try to improve upon the perfection of God. And a lot of times we do that. I want to determine so that everything that I've done is right and everything that you do is wrong, right? So that you're always indebted to me and I'm never indebted to you. It becomes the self-serving nature. God isn't looking at individual sins so much as he's looking at that condition of our hearts. Is what you're doing doing to serve yourself or to serve God, to serve and bring glory to God? That the way we live in our lives is for a purpose outside of ourselves or is it to be setting ourselves up as our own God and asking for people's worship of ourselves? So the rebellion happens. Um, uh, humans said, we want the top slot. We want to decide what is good and evil. Um, uh, there, there's this, there's this uh, phrase in Hong Kong, um, when, when uh, you talk about what you believe in, uh, uh, Chinese will say, I believe in myself. I will work it out myself. And um, that is sort of the natural tendency, right? Let's, let's go to the next picture, the one of the uh, angel and Adam and Eve. So, so here's, uh, my, that's quite the angel, isn't it? As, as I was, uh, I mean, you, could, you can Google this, and there's all kinds of different ways that this angel is depicted, because the, the Bible says that when Adam and Eve were uh, expelled from the garden, there were, that, that there were two angels that were assigned to the garden to guard the entrance so that they could not enter back in. Now, here he's just looking like real powerful, right? Like nobody's going to mess with me. On some of the pictures, it looks like, you get out of here, you wretched scum. And there's one that I saw where it's more like this, where the angel's more like sorrowful. This is what has to happen because of the consequences of the actions that have taken place. But, but when you look down into the, into the fine print of the Scripture, it says that God sent them out to protect them from the garden. That the way of God showing His mercy at this point was to make sure that they would not eat from the, from the tree of life, therefore sealing their fate to be isolated from God forever. And thus it was that the garden remains closed, that we go through intermediaries of priests and sacrifices and such in order to get to God, in order to have relationship with Him, until scene three. And God prophesies it in His words to the Satan right here in verse 15. G Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He's speaking to the serpent, and he says, I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. The offspring of Eve will strike the head of the serpent, and you will get his heel. It's the beginning promise of God saying, I will send an offspring of this woman. I will defeat you, Satan, through human beings, the human being of Jesus, who will one day come and will knock you out. He will destroy your empire, Satan. He will establish a way again to enter back into the fellowship with God that comes from the Garden of Eden. So let's have the next word and slide. In Eden, the entrance is blocked, but in Jesus, the door is open. Because Jesus says, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They'll come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief or the serpent or Satan's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. God's desire for you is a rich and satisfying life. It happens by you 
not trying to set up your own empire, but it comes from you humbling yourself, humbling ourselves, and entering through the door of Jesus in order to enter back into that Garden of Eden fellowship with who God is. In essence, for the last image, the cross of Jesus becomes our tree of life. We enter in at the door of the life of Jesus that comes from Him giving up His life for each of us. It's the story of Christmas. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank You that You did not stay far off. Thank You that You did not keep us isolated, but that You provided a way. In Jesus' name, amen.